Sunday, everybody. How are you doing? I love seeing your faces. Thanks for being here in church. For those that I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Pastor Anthony. My wife and I get to lead this awesome church, the best church on the planet, if you ask me. And yes, I'm biased, but it's okay. I'm God's favorite. Right? But we're glad that you made it here. As, as it was said earlier, we've been praying for you, and I believe that God has some wonderful eat for each and every person sitting in here as well as for those that may be joining us in our e-church our online church thank you for watching tuning in listening in um, i do want to take a special moment to welcome those who are here for the very first time today our first time guests let's just give our hand for our first time guests glad that you can make it glad that you could join us and we have a free gift for you it's a worship CD from one of our missions partners who's also an amazing worship leader. So we'd like to put that CD into your hand. Um, so before you leave this place, just find any one of our amazing RLC squad volunteers. They've got a lanyard and a big smile, um, and they'll be happy to put that CD in your hand. We also have a special tool that we've created for those that are going to be um, with us in this message, um, engaged in this message. Say engaged engaged in this message. It's called our RLC Insight Card. You'll find that on your seat back in front of you. You can go ahead and reach and pull that out. It's a little white card. It's just got a couple points that I'd love for you to just take down as you're listening to the Word of God, what, as God is moving in you, and as God is doing things that He wants to do through you. You're going to want to write something down, like something that stands out, a verse, anything that you hear from today's message. Go ahead and write it down on that card, and then you want to take this card and put it somewhere where you'll run into it throughout the week. So that the word of God can continue to minister to you as you are changing and growing as we do when we submit our lives to him. Ain't that right, church? Yeah. All right, let's pray and get started. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for what you're about to do. In fact, we are so ready. Like, this is why we came. This is what we're here for, to hear from heaven. And so, Father, we are positioning our hearts right now to receive everything that you would have for us. Father, I pray against any distraction. Anything that is right now trying to compete for our time is not of you. So we put those lists away. We put those worries away. We put those things that perhaps are, are weighing us down away. And instead, God, we choose to be with you in this moment. We choose to be present here, knowing, God, that as we are here with you, you are going to perform the miraculous because that's the kind of God that you are. And so, Father, we say thank you for that. We are so excited about that. Move in this place. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 So I'm loving this series that we're in at a church. as a church. It's called Soul Food. Say Soul Food. Soul Food. And so what we've been doing over the past several weeks is we've been talking about what are the things that we need to do as individuals to nourish our soul. What are the things that our soul craves in order to be enlarged and in order to grow? And do you know that the things that God would call food for our soul are often very different from what the world would call food for our soul? The world tells us to nourish our, thing, our soul on things like accolades and uh, 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 on things like accomplishment, success, money, you name it. Those things aren't the things that are going to cause our soul to increase and be nourished. The one and only thing that feeds our soul is Christ. And we talked about that throughout these last couple weeks. We even coined this phrase last week, Christ does suffice. Will you say that with me? Christ does suffice. One more time. Christ does suffice. Like you mean it. Christ does suffice. What the, what the, what? All right. Christ does suffice. That simply means Christ is enough. Christ is enough. Whatever we're looking for, whatever we need, we find in Christ. We can't get it twisted. When we try to substitute it with other things, we always end up empty of what we truly need. We always end up unfulfilled from the only thing that will truly fulfill us, which is Christ. So we began to kind of talk about, well, what are those different things that we can find in Christ or that we can do through Christ? That will nourish our soul. So week one, we talked about worship. Anybody in here like to worship? How about that worship this morning? Come on, team. Come on, team. Worship. And what we discovered is worship is more than just a song. Worship is the way that we live our life. And as I think of worship as an element of soul food, if, if worship 
was food on my soul food plate, it would be some mac and cheese. Come on, amen. Come on, amen. Cheesy, salty, good mac and cheese. The things that kind of, mac and cheese goes with anything these days. I don't know if you know that. They'd they be throwing all kinds of stuff on mac and cheese. Beef, lobster, all kinds of meat and beef. It's just because that's what mac and cheese does for me. It, it, it makes me want to worship God. Can I just get real? It makes me say, Jesus, Jesus. And then the week after that, we talked about prayer and how prayer is nourishment for our soul. How we must be praying without ceasing. Never stop praying. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians. Having a, an, a conscious understanding of God at all times and taking him with us wherever we go. Letting him impact our lives and our thoughts and impact our decisions. And prayer for me on my soul food plate is like a good pot of greens. It's rich in nutrients. It's got all kinds of flavor. It helps keeps me strong throughout the day. Who here doesn't like a good bar, pot of greens? <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently by myself. Now, although I would say that nothing beats some good mac and cheese, and, and I would also say that there's nothing better than a legit pot of greens, These foods without some meat do not a soul food plate make. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about this thing called devotion. Devotion to the word of God. Devotion to me is my meat on that spiritual soul food plate. It can be any kind of meat, church. I don't discriminate, discriminate against my meat. Maybe you're a fan of beef. Let's go ahead and throw on those barbecue ribs on that soul food plate. That's good. Maybe you don't like beef. Maybe you like chicken. Maybe that's your flavor. Go ahead and throw on some fried chicken. That could be my meat on my soul food plate. But you can do chicken all kinds of ways. What about chicken that's barbecue? We'll do that too. Or how about chicken that's smothered in gravy? You know you want some of that. Or for some of y'all in here, you might like, I like my chicken with a little bit of hot sauce. Or if you're like some people, you like your hot sauce with a little bit of chicken. We can also have some fish. Don't leave out the fish pescado. Did I say that right? Did I say that? Look at baby C, working that Espanol. Fried catfish. <laughs> now, if you're in this and you're this in this room and you knew that that little ball, hush puppy, come on! You notice that little that little lemon on the end? That's when you know you you into some good soul food. If you don't know what we're talking about, you need some black friends. I'm just saying, you need to go hang out in the hood or in the country with some black folk. I love y'all. They're like, stop, stop, before I get myself in trouble. Yeah, I would venture to say that the meat of our soul food plate is the Word of God. It is the centerpiece. It is the thing that nourishes us. And so we're going to start off today by going to the Word of God. Did you bring your Bible today? Come on, RLC, did you bring your Bible today? Hold it up. I need to see it. Stand to your feet. If you're able, go ahead, stand to your feet, whether you brought the old school leather-bound version or the new school digital. No. Hold that Bible up. Like you mean it, we're going to wave it. Go with me in your Bible to Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, 12. We're going to jump right in here. Hebrews 4, 12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, 
cutting between soul and spirit, between joints and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Now, have you ever heard of the term APB? We need an APB. Anybody watch any of those cop shows? APB, you hear it all the time. You know when they're putting out an APB on something, there's a search going on. Like, they want everybody involved. We're really looking. We're really pursuing. Do you know what APB stands for? All Points Bulletin. I heard it. Some people know All Points Bulletin. See, I think the Word of God should be our All Points Bulletin. We should commit all our resources to pursuing its content as if it has every answer to every concern we have in our life because it does. Its importance is far greater than we could ever possibly imagine. Capturing the Word of God is more important than capturing any person, than pursuing anything. It is our APB. It is our all points bulletin. It is the thing that we should alert everyone to be on the lookout for and everyone to be pursuing and everyone to want to capture its content. In fact, we learn in Hebrews 4.12, as we just said, the word of God is our APB. It is alive. It is powerful. Boom. That was too much of a stretch, too much of a stretch. Y'all, y'all are with me. You're like, y'all are you're like, really, really? Look, well, I went for it. I went all the way for it. See, as Christians, we're to devote ourselves to pursuing God's word, and it needs to come from a sincere place of love. Say love. When you love something, it's easy to devote yourself to it. Think about it. When you love something... It's easy to devote yourself to it because true devotion comes from a place of sincere love. I love my wife. My wife is beautiful. Look at her. She's gorgeous. Everybody look at her. It'll make her feel uncomfortable. (laughs) She's gorgeous. She's fine. She's smart. She's intelligent. She's actually the most incredible person I've ever met in my life. And so I've devoted my life to serving her. She also makes beautiful babies, just, just so you know. Now, how, do I, how does she know that I'm devoted to her? Well, my actions better speak as well as my words speak. Otherwise, it ain't much devotion. If I truly love and am devoted to her as I am, that means I spend time with her, a lot of it. It means I put others before her. It means I don't... <laughs> she, just <laughs> she said, no, you don't. <laughs> I put her first. Yes, slipping. I put her first. I put her before others. That's what I meant to say. I don't reject her love for me. Can help me fix my mistakes. I spend time with her. I put her before others. And I don't reject her love for me. Today, today we're going to talk about what are the three keys that I think are indicators of our devotion to Christ. So if you're taking notes, this is a, this is, these are some good points for you to jot down on that inside card. I'd say the first key, number one, is time. Time. When you're devoted to something, you make time for it. I think that time is one clear, indisputable measure of devotion. We cannot claim to live a life devoted to God if we're not making time for him. I think time is honestly our most valuable gift that we could give to God or anyone. Time is that one thing you can't make more of. You can make more money. You can gain more friends. You can't make more time. Time is limited. Time is important. God wants our time. And when we give God our time, as we pursue him, and reading the word of God, that's our way of saying that we are devoted to him. We give him our time. My wife and I have been together since 1997, so over 20 years. In fact, 
September 14th of this year will be our 15th year wedding anniversary. It's awesome. Especially considering that I'm only 25. Man, I married young. Here's the thing, I'm pretty certain in that, in that amount of time, that 20 plus years that we've been together, that the number of days that I haven't spoken to her, I could probably count on one hand in 20 years. That's how much I love her, that's how much we are devoted to each other in some shape or form, whether even when we've been out of town and on trips, there's been a text, there's been an email, there's always an aspect of me giving her my time because I'm devoted to her. So hear me, church, when I say this. If you are not spending daily time in the word of God, engaging with him, I question your devotion. I question how devoted you are to him. The one who created you and everything. And if you aren't giving him your time, how devoted are you to him, really? Time matters, and your time matters to him. Yes. Psalm 119 verse 20 says this, My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. At all times. Does your soul long for God? Are you consumed by seeking his presence at all times? See, I'm at a point in my life where I'd rather have an unsuccessful day with God than a successful day without him. Anytime. Because I don't want to do anything unless God is involved. Because I know when I do things and I don't involve God in it, eventually I mess that thing up. But when I do things and I do it with God, even if I mess it up, he redeems it. Because he is the redeeming kind of God. See, the primary way that I make sure that I spend time with God is by being in his word. I study it. I meditate on it. I memorize it. I'm obsessed with it because it works. Because I've seen the change that it's made in my life. I see the fruit that comes from me spending time with God. And sometimes I think we overcomplicate this thing. I think we get so ahead of ourselves, I think we set unrealistic expectations to what time with God would look like. Get yourself a win. If, if a win for you is opening your Bible in the morning, reading one verse and meditating on it throughout the day, do you know that God is pleased by that? I think we get these unrealistic expectations, not that we shouldn't want more, and not that we shouldn't be growing in more. Now, if you stay there, that's a problem. But if you start there and you grow from there, I call that victory. Sometimes we over-romanticize what it should be like, and therefore we can't live up to our own expectations, and we get frustrated. Well, I want to wake up in my time with God, open up my double doors, like sun is shining, go out into my cedar closet, have my cup of soy chai latte, pull out my journal, pull out my Bible and six different translations <laughs> and then sit with God and pray for two hours, wait for a word, then dive into his word for another three. Like, that sounds wonderful. That sounds great. And amen. Should we all want to aspire to do more things? But if we think that that is the standard, no wonder we're frustrated. Y'all know that God can slap me upside the head with one word. Sometimes I, sometimes I could straight up be in the word of God for hours, get lost in it. And I'm like, God, I've been studying these scriptures and I've been doing all these things and I, 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 I've, been, I've been trying to hear from you here. And he's like, brother, when the minute you walked in, I told you to forgive. Go back and do that first. The minute you walked in here, I said, how about you trust me? And now you're trying to theologize your way out of the challenge that you're in. You're trying to work your way into my grace when I already gave it to you. There are times where we just need to make sure that we are in the presence of God and let God does do what only God can do. But you got to make time for him. You got to make intentional time for him. You got to protect it. Watch him move through you and watch him grow in you. 
So key number one of devotion is time. Key number two, value. Value. You might be like, well, what do you mean by value? See, when you are devoted to something, it has value. It's worthy of your fidelity. One way that my wife knows I'm devoted to her is because I've made a vow to commit myself to her and her alone. She is my one and only wife. There is no other woman that has my affection. She's the only one. In fact, there is no one else that even comes close because I do everything that I can to protect it. She has value to me. Whatever holds value in your life is what you will truly devote yourself to. So I want you to just do a little bit of personal inventory right now, even as I say that. Whatever has the most value to you is what you truly devote your life to. What is the thing that is of greatest value to you? Be honest with yourself. Right here, in this moment, what is the thing that has the most value to you? See, many in our culture believe that when we're talking about things of value, especially things of monetary value, that, that gold is the most valuable thing that the world can offer. It cannot be tarnished. It shines with a glow like, like nothing other not, like nothing else of, of, a, of a natural element. It is one of those metals that throughout human history, people have bowed down to gold. Yet, I believe that God's word is far more valuable than any metal, than anything that gold could ever offer. Psalms 119, 127 says, Truly, I love your commands more than gold. Even the finest gold. Each of your commandments is right. This is why I hate every false way. This is why I hate every false way. When we devote ourselves to the word of God and we allow him to begin to change our heart, we will begin to see things the way that God sees things. We will begin to devote ourselves to God's ways instead of the world's ways. There can come a time in our lives where things that we used to see that we thought shine like gold, that had extreme value, that are the things that we wanted to align our life with, all of a sudden are dull, tarnished, and worth nothing in comparison to the precious word of God. Gold can't change you like the way that the Word of God can change you. See, when we value the Word of God, we learn to love and value His ways. We seek to be obedient to His ways to the point of sacrifice. We're willing to give things up for Him. We care more about being righteous than we do about being comfortable. In fact, I think that's what devotion is. Devotion is caring more about being righteous than we do about being comfortable. Sometimes I think comfortability is my worst enemy. Because when I get comfortable, I get laxed. When I get laxed, I get less protective of the word of God and the principles of God because all of a sudden I think I've worked myself into a comfortable place and I can sit back and relax in my own strength. It doesn't take much for the world and the devil and all his demons to come alongside and try to take me out, out of that place because I'm resting in me instead of resting in him. An antidote to that attack is to make sure that I'm very aware of what I truly value. Because what I value is what I will devote myself to. So here's something we must accept as followers of Christ. What the world values is very different than what God values. The world says, 
Take for yourself. God says, give to others. The world says, seek to be served. God says, live to serve the least of these. The world says, get even. God says, forgive always. The world says, you live your truth, boo. You do you. God says, I am the truth. Live for me. The world says, value your life above all else. Only the strongest survive. Whereas God says, if you give up your life for me, only then will you truly save it. If there's one thing we should value above our very lives, it's our devotion to God. Church, we are to value the word of God as if our very soul depends on it, because it truly does. And the third key to living a devoted life First one was time. Second one was value. The third one is trust. If we make time to spend in God's word, if we value the word of God more than we value the greatest riches this world has to offer, then we should ultimately trust. Trust that everything in it is true and we can live our lives walking in that blessed assurance. Do you trust that the word of God is true? Do you trust that God is who he says he is and will do what the Bible says he will do? Do you live your life as if it was true? Jeremiah 17, verse 7. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord. And have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. Say hope. hope. Say confidence. confidence. Say hope. hope. Say confidence. confidence. Say hope. hope. Say confidence. confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by the long months of drought. Their leaves stay green. <laughs> And they never stop producing fruits. See, the word of God says we're actually blessed when we trust in him. That it's through the Lord that we find our hope and our confidence. Our, I love that, our hope and our confidence. We are living in a world, church, where there's so many people that are so hopeless. People that seemingly have everything that are taking their lives. That are living the dream. But they don't have their hope and they don't have their confidence. I think the most dangerous thing that we could do is begin to walk in our own self-made confidence. And our own self-made assurance. And then when we feel like we have everything we've ever wanted, everything we've ever strived to achieve, and are still left with a big gaping hole in our life, we have no hope. And we lack all confidence. Well, I find my hope and I find my confidence in the Word of God. I find my hope and I find my confidence in the truth that is Jesus Christ. I find my hope and I find my confidence and the fact that he loves me so much that he gave me his very best. So why wouldn't I want to give him my very best? It's a privilege to spend time with my God. It's a privilege to wake up and open my Bible. And know that all I have to do is speak a word. And the God that created everything is coming right down, sitting right there with me saying, I want to meet your every need. You are my son. I have a purpose and I have a plan for you. The things that I've put in you will find their way to completion if you just trust me. 
And as you trust me, guess what? I'm going to ask you to stop doing some things and to start doing other things. I'm going to ask you to stop living a life of impurity and start walking in the truth. I'm going to ask you to put down your addictions and your compulsions and your behaviors and pick up my love and my assurance and my confidence because that's the only thing that's going to carry you through. Me fighting that not only does my God a disservice, breaks his heart, but it will cause me to lose hope and cause me to lose confidence. When my roots are planted deep in the water, <laughs> I love it, that the heat, worried by the long months of drought, they don't cause my leaves to wither, but they stay green, always producing fruit. Are you producing fruit in your life? If there is a, uh, an area in your life that you know that you're not producing fruit in, I would ask, do you trust God and are you giving that area to him? Trust is accompanied in obedience. So I'm not talking about just praying about saying, God, I'm struggling in this and I'm giving it to you. And God says, well, hey, how about you come to church regularly? How about you join a life group? How about you sign up for a, a step study or celebrate recovery? How about you do these things? And it's like, well, no, God, I just want to submit it to you. But I want to keep doing what I'm going to do. And that's not trust. That's trusting that you think you know more than God and that you want to play God and you're not. You're very bad at it. So am I. But instead say, God, I, I'm going to speak your words over my life which says that I am more than a conqueror. I am an overcomer. That says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That no weapon formed against me shall proper, prosper. That no tongue that rises against me will produce any harm in my life. When you have the word of God in you, you have the sword to fight with and you can cut off the heads of demons and there's no more satisfaction for you. What a satisfying feeling. At this time, I'm going to welcome up well, welcome up Pastor Bill Hughes. And I've asked Pastor Bill to share for a couple moments what devotion in his life looks like as he nourishes his own soul. Good morning. I'm a mechanic. I have a, the kind of mind that desires to know how things work. I learned about cars from my dad and logic and carpentry for my granddad. I didn't just swing as a kid. I felt the gravity, the acceleration, the, what I would learn is centrifugal force. And I used that and, and shifted my weight to go higher, faster than, than the other kids. I learned how to skate faster using my long legs to my advantage. I even had them then, I had them then. It frustrated me that Steve could ride his bike faster when I could beat him in every other challenge. I was raised in the church, but it held little value because it was not a priority for daddy. I didn't care about excelling. I didn't care about fruit in my life. I didn't care about getting saved until my friend Glenn got baptized. And then I wanted to be baptized. When I started driving, I started skipping church and went riding with my friends. Finally, I dropped out of church. At 25, my life was a train wreck. Everything I touched was a wreck. There were many hurt people, including me. Through introspection and analysis of life's failures, I could see that all the things that I did that were wrong, and I hated myself for them. Life was not a dream. It was more like a walking nightmare. I asked Jesus to come into my heart and life and be the new conductor to get my life back on track to bring me joy because I had zero joy. My life didn't change overnight. I needed to know how to make life work correctly. I went back to church. I learned a few verses. This time I worked at them to see what they were saying to me. The first was this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, 
It's not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. I learned that God has a plan for, for me. He has work for me to do in this life. And I already knew that my plans didn't work, so it was easy for me to want his. When my life was in the pit of despair, I couldn't care for my family. I used the word of God to stay somewhat up and, and continue functioning. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil times. In the days of famine, they will be satisfied. I clung to that. My family's life was famine, lack, and my life was pointless. David continues in this psalm. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he will not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I knew that nothing I did came to a good end, so I desperately clung to those words. I knew God would bring us to an end that was good and no longer those horrible situations. Many other things happen in life, usually because of my hand on the controls and sometimes what others were able to do to me because I was outside the plan of God. That means wrong place, wrong time. As years passed, I memorized other scriptures I became a student of the word to believe and have faith in what God promised that he would do for my family and me. At times I would try my hand at guiding the train. You'd think that a train on rails, there's not a lot you have to do to make it work right. Come on. I still made mistakes. I hurt my children. I hurt my family, I hurt me. I now know that God has a plan. It's a good plan because, he's, because he is a good God. And the basics of the plan of God are outlined in his word. I study the word and he reveals steps to me. He talks to me while I study to reveal specific things that I need to do for today or tomorrow. And Jesus reveals his love for me. Studying the word of God has become soul food for me. I invest my time, my devotion to the word, and he teaches me. The word changed my life. And although not all of them may know it or remember it, it changed my family's life too. I'm a mechanic. I wanna know how life works. I choose God's plan for life over my mistakes and failures and pointless life. There are more than 40 verses that have been referenced or quoted just now. His words define my life. So if your life of train wrecks needs to be changed, I submit to you the word of God. I recommend that you devour the word and learn about his plan and operations for a life of purpose. God bless you. Yeah, when it comes to nourishing our soul, I don't know if there is a greater tool to do that than the Word of God. And for many of us who've perhaps been in our, been on our Christian walk for a long time, I realize that this is not a new thought. And I realize it'd be very easy in this moment to dismiss what we're hearing with a, like, well, yeah, I know that. But I know what I feel very convicted in my own life is it's different to know something 
and it's different to do something. It's different to just understand that something works than it is to not only understand it, but to embody and engage it. If you are sitting in this place right now, and there is an aspect of your life that is going off the tracks, that is causing you to live life in such a way where there is no alternative ending other than a giant train wreck. What I would ask you is, are you soaking in the word of God? Are you allowing God to speak to you? Are you allowing God to work in you so that you can get his desired outcome? One of the greatest changes that I've experienced as I continue to grow in the word of God is all of a sudden my dreams and the things that I've always thought I wanted and desired have been completely replaced by his. And the most amazing, truly miraculous thing has happened as I've watched that transformation take place. I'm embarrassed by how rich my life is. And it's not rich because of the circumstances that I'm in. It's rich because of my relationship with him and now how I look at those circumstances. There's so many things that I would have missed before. So many people in my life that I would have overlooked. Opportunities that God has given me that I would have seen as not great opportunities at all. There wouldn't be a Redeemed Life Church. If I had things my way, <laughs> y'all, I was going to be a superstar. Y'all don't even know. I was going to be living for myself. I would have never called it that. I would have been the first person to say, oh, generosity was in me. After I received my first Oscar, I was going to buy my mom a house. I was going to take care of my family. And I was going to be empty and continuing to try to fill a void with things and accolades and applause that, that I have now because I love my God. My life is an embarrassment of riches. And God is responsible for all of it. And what God has done in me, God also wants to do in you. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, I thank you. I thank you so much for how amazing it is to be refreshed emotionally and spiritually by reading your word, by meditating on it, by absorbing it into my, my heart, my mind, and letting it feed my soul. Father, I thank you that you are a loving God, that it's because of your great love and your great compassion that you sent your son to perish for my sins so that I could live eternally with you. God, I thank you for your faithfulness, for your deliverance, for the things of you that give me such a great hope and such a great confidence. I thank you that you are interested in me, that you are mindful of me, that you are faithful to deliver me from all the things that would come to try to steal, kill, and destroy my life. And I thank you, God, that it is the desire of your heart that every son and every daughter, every man and every woman in this place would know you. Father, I thank you for what your word says in Lamentations 3.22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Father, I thank you that salvation only comes from you. That we recognize that we have a desperate need for you. That you are our living water. Father, I pray that our souls be nourished to completion in you. And I know that the only way that we can come to such a place of nourishment is, is, is if we know your son, Jesus Christ. Now, perhaps you're sitting in this place today and you would say, I do not know him. 
but you feel right now in your in your spirit a, a kind of tug, a kind of heat, a kind of a kind of draw. That is the love of God drawing you to Him. And if you're in this place and you've never received God into your life, you've never accepted Jesus as the Son of God, knowing that He died on the cross for your sins, that He defeated death and the grave and was raised that he has now prepared a place for you in heaven, I'd like to give you the greatest opportunity you could ever be given. I'd like to extend an invitation, an invitation to know him and an invitation to follow him. So if you're in this place and you would like to receive Jesus into your life, in just a moment I'm going to ask that everybody in this place say a prayer together. And as we say that prayer out loud all together, our heads are bowed, we're not looking around, this isn't about anybody else but you. This is about this moment where you get to come home. You get to come home to the Father and be overwhelmed by his love. And if you're in this place and you want to experience that love, that unconditional, unfailing, overflowing, everlasting love, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to be bold and to put your hand in the air. Once you do, I'm just simply going to make eye contact with you and you can put your hand right back down. That's it. And then we're all going to pray together. We're going to pray loudly and we're going to pray boldly because all of heaven is excited, <laughs> excited about this very moment as you come home to your father. So on the count of three, if that's you, you're just going to put your hand in the air. Be bold. Trust God. He is your hope and your confidence. One, two, three. Go ahead and put your hand in the air. Go ahead and put your hand in the air. We praise you, God. 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 We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. All right, church, everybody say this prayer. Repeat after me. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. I believe he is the son of God, that he died for me, that he defeated death for me, and that he's prepared a place in heaven for me. Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. And I declare from this day forward, I will serve you with all that I am by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, church. I'd like everybody in this place to go ahead and pull out your connect card. It's that white card with that green line that Lori talked about earlier. If everyone in this place can go ahead and pull out one of those cards. If you haven't had an opportunity, you can continue to go ahead and complete it and fill it out. Because in just a moment, our amazing team is going to receive those cards from you. Make sure you write down a prayer request because we do want to be praying for you. And if you were in this place and you made a decision to receive Christ, there is a box that says, I received Christ today. Will you just do me a favor and check that box? All that's going to happen is somebody from our team is going to reach out to you during this week. We're going to send you one email. And then my wife or myself is personally going to try and connect with you just so that we can encourage you. So we can tell you that God loves you. And so that we can say, welcome to the family. You can call me Uncle Ant. I'm so glad that you made that decision. And we're so excited about what God is going to continue to do in your life as you devote yourself to following him. We also have a free gift for you. If you made that decision, it is our new believer's journal. And we'd love to put this in your hand. In a moment or so, we're gonna have an opportunity to pray as a church and to come down and receive prayer. Um, if you made that decision, you can let anyone on our prayer team know that you did and they will get this journal into your hand. And I encourage you to go ahead and open it, write your name on the inside cover, write the date, and then write what God spoke to you in these special moments. And then you will treasure this journal for the rest of your life. It's that moment where you made a decision to follow God and everything changed. Can we give them one more round of applause for those that made that decision? So awesome. So awesome. Now we're going to continue to worship God and the receiving of our tithes and our offerings. My wife Bonnie's going to come up and lead us in that moment. You can go ahead and reach into that seat back in front of you and pull out that offering envelope. You can begin to fill that out. 
There's also an opportunity to, for you to give online, whether you're old school with check and credit card or new school through our Push to Pay app, which is just a simple app that you can download and be giving, begin to give that way. You can do that. This is the time for that. I want to say thank you. Um, God bless you. Thank you, as always, for giving me the opportunity to share the word of God with you. It is the greatest joy of my life. And I do consider it an honor that you give up your time and allow me to do that. And I know and I believe that God is doing some amazing things in our hearts because the word of God is powerful. So thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that word. Opportunities. So I get the honor of leading us in this next portion of our service, which is our tithes and offerings. And I love what Pastor said about there is an embarrassment of riches. And I think as Americans, we perhaps sometimes lose perspective of that. And what I love as a church, that we constantly have missions that are going out. And right now we currently have our international missions team is in Uganda. And they're blessing mamas right now that are raising not only their own children, but children that have been orphaned through the pandemic of HIV. And I love that as a church, perhaps we are not physically necessarily called to go and be the hands and feet of Jesus, but we are called to partner with our brothers and sisters and to make a difference in that way. And I believe that when we talk about an embarrassment of riches, it's all about the perspective. I love how he said, it all depends on how I look at my circumstances. And I think we all have been in a position where perhaps we look at our lives and we can say, okay, I am blessed beyond measure because of my family, because of my job. And I think it's a reminder for us. I believe that it's the opportunities like right now where we can partner together as a church. And we bring in what we can, but together we make a difference because the Lord is the one that multiplies it, right? And I love how in Galatians 6.10 it says, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And I believe that as a church, we also partner up with our national ministry and we have our, our local ministry, which is Homework House. And it's about bringing that opportunity and that richness to those around us. And what I love is that as a, as a church, we give to these ministries. But what's really great is that some of the people who are taking advantage of these great works that are out there is also people who are in our church within our house. So it's a double blessing as we give. And I also believe that as we move forward as a church and we're starting our vacation Bible school camp for kids this summer, that's also just another opportunity. And what I love is that that's made possible by us, by a church, by just coming together and say, okay, we're going to put our tithes and offering together. And we know that God's going to change it, not just for us as a church, because that would be so limited, but for the community. Because then these kids are going to grow up and they're going to be the ones that are making a change nationally and internationally. And that's what's exciting to us. So I'm going to lead us in prayer as we prepare our, our tithes and offerings. And I say, Lord, thank you, God. Thank you so much for your word, Lord. Thank you so much that we get to be a partner in the kingdom, God. Lord, we say that you can take our tithes and offerings in you, Lord. You're the one that funnels them exactly where they need to go. So, God, today we say thank you. Thank you for the embarrassment of riches in our own home. Thank you so much for the blessing that you have given us and bestowed upon us as individuals. Thank you that we are alive and healthy to come to your house. That we don't fear for our lives. That we get to walk into your house and say, I devote my life to my Father. So God, we say, take our tithes and offerings, Lord. And you multiply them, God. And you funnel them exactly where they need to go. Lord, it's our our embarrassment of riches, of the blessings that we know that are in our lives and they're about to enter our lives. So we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to partner. In Jesus' name, amen, church, amen. The ushers will serve us in a little bit. 